How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Saw through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory Cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my Lord
Good morning and welcome to our service. We've just been singing about Christ, our living hope. And as we've just coming off the back of Easter, that's what we've been remembering, isn't it? In the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, because he's alive, we have a living hope. And that's just wonderful. And we can remember Jesus, our living hope together as we meet this morning. Just a couple of things to remind you of. Please do look at Church Family News, which is available on the website. And also um, just a reminder that Discipleship Explored after a break for Easter Day last week starts up again at 6.30 this evening on Zoom. Now, uh, this morning uh, we have a guest preacher. Uh, preaching for us which is great. Uh, some of you will know and remember Lee Gatiss who used to be a curate here at St Botolph's and who is now the director of Church Society. He's going to be preaching for us a little bit later on in our service on 1 Corinthians 15. But at the beginning of 1 Corinthians um, in verse 18 it says this, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As we've reflected over these last weeks on the cross and resurrection, we can be reminded from 1 Corinthians that actually for, for us who now entrust the Lord Jesus, it's the power of God, it's the way we can be saved. So let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you so much that we can meet together this morning. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that through the cross we are saved. And Lord, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you that through the resurrection we have a living hope. Lord, please would you help us to grow to know and love Jesus more through our time together this morning. We pray in his name. Amen. And we need the cross and the resurrection because of our sin, because of our failure and our inability to live for God in any way. We need his grace, his forgiveness and we need the cross. So let's confess together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. A little bit later on in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 a bit after the verse that we're going to look at uh, later on it says this the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ through Jesus we have the victory we have forgiveness we are washed clean and we have hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for that. Thank you that when we come before you and ask for forgiveness, you wash us clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Thank you that through the cross there is victory. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're going to go over to Helen now, and Helen is going to help us think it, to, to think a bit about being brave and reminding us that God is with us.
Have you ever been afraid of something? Really quite scared? Maybe you've been asked to stand up in front of the whole school and read something. Or maybe, maybe you've done something wrong and you're a bit worried about owning up and saying sorry. Maybe you feel a bit shy when you're meeting new people. Well, today I'm going to tell you about somebody who was a bit scared, but God looked after him. This man's name was Joshua, and Joshua was the helper of another man called Moses. And Moses was the leader of God's chosen people. They were called the Hebrews. Now Moses had led those people out from Egypt where they'd been slaves for hundreds of years. And they were traveling back to the land of Israel that God had promised them. Now Israel was the country where the Hebrews great, 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 great grandparents had left hundreds of years before. And they were going back there and they'd already spent 40 years traveling in the desert. Now, God had promised them their own land, but they had to defeat the people that were already living there first. So, during the years in the desert, the people had disobeyed God many, many times, but God kept saving them and forgiving them and eventually they were nearly ready to take the land that God had promised them. But then Moses died and Joshua became the leader of the Israelite people. Hmm, I wonder how Joshua felt. I think I would have been really scared. Really, really scared. You see, there were literally millions of people who now all looked to him to lead them. And Joshua had to make some really important decisions. Now Joshua had a particularly difficult task to, to take the people into their land. You see, there was a city called Jericho and the people had to take that city in battle but the city was surrounded by a very, very big wall. It was humongous. How on earth were they going to get past that wall? Hmm. Now, God spoke to Joshua and God told him the same thing over and over again. Joshua, be strong and be brave. Be strong and brave and remember to obey what I have taught you. And again, God said to Joshua, remember that I have commanded you to be strong and brave. Don't be afraid because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And God told Joshua exactly what the people had to do so that they could capture the city of Jericho. It was a bit strange. This is what God said. You must make the people walk around the entire city wall once every day for six days. The priests will go at the front of all the people and lead them around the walls of the city. Now the priests were the special people who led the whole nation when they were worshipping God. The priests are also to take with them trumpets made of the horns of sheep. That's very odd. Then God said to Joshua, on the seventh day all the people with the priests at the front must walk around the city seven times. Not once, not twice, but seven times. And as they walk, 
the priests must blow on the trumpets made from the sheep's horns. And when the priests blow on the trumpets, all the people must give a big shout. Hurrah! Just like that, but louder. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to blow a trumpet, but it's quite hard to get a note out of it. So probably the priests knew how to do it. And they made a big sound. And anyway, that's what God told Joshua to tell the people to do. Now I expect there were some people who thought Joshua had gone a little bit crazy. That's not how you defeat a city, by walking around it and blowing on trumpets and shouting at the tops of your voices. But God had told Joshua that's what the people had to do. And Joshua trusted God. He knew that God could do whatever he said he would do. And so the people did what Joshua said. And do you know what happened to those walls around the city of Jericho? When the trumpets sounded da, 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 and the people shouted hurrah! The walls fell flat and all the people could go into the city. Do you remember what God told Joshua? That's right, be strong and be brave for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Do you know when Jesus was living on the earth, he taught people the same thing. And if we put our trust in him and do the things that he teaches us, then he has promised never to leave us. And we can hold on to this promise because God is the same today as he was when Joshua was alive hundreds of years ago. And God always keeps his promises. So, if you're scared about anything, if you're worried or anxious about whatever you have to do, then remember, do what Jesus, is, Jesus has taught us to do and put our trust in him. Be brave, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. <laughs> Bye everybody. I hope to see you soon. Bye.
created using Powtoon. We begin our prayers this morning with some words of scripture from 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the risen Lord Jesus, the living God with us today through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus and his triumph over death on that first Easter day. Give us the knowledge of his presence that we may be strengthened and built up through his risen life. We pray and look forward with anticipation to the day when he will come again in glory. God our Father, we bow before you in worship and praise. You have loved us and you've shown yourself faithful to us. Your word is mighty like your name. And when we call to you, you answer our prayer and give us the strength we need. Though you are majestic, you care for the lowly, but the proud cannot hide from you. When our troubles are too much for us to bear, you keep us safe. Your love is unchangeable from everlasting to everlasting. Help us, Lord, to reflect on our relationship with you and rejoice in our salvation. We pray that you will finish in us the work you have begun through Jesus our Saviour. We turn our thoughts now to our broken world. Lord of creation, as we hear the news of suffering everywhere in your troubled world, as individuals, we feel helpless to affect any meaningful change. We have our hope in your compassion and mercy, knowing that Jesus suffered to do your will. Although we cannot see a way forward, we know that you are there in the darkness to strengthen us. Loving God of mercy and grace, through the Holy Spirit, stretch out your hand of comfort and healing to this broken world. Make all things new in Christ, spreading justice and peace where there is crisis and disaster. We think particularly of Syria, Nigeria, North Africa, Lebanon and the Yemen, where extremist fundamentalist groups create terror, devastation and death. We pray too for Hong Kong and the oppressed groups in China, Korea and Myanmar. The Christians so far, and Christians far and wide risking their lives to worship freely. We pray for your wisdom, intervention and challenge to those in power to seek just, fair and peaceful resolutions. We pray too for displaced families everywhere fleeing from atrocities and persecution. Heavenly Father, comfort them and help them find security, stability and peace in their lives. As Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. We pray for our country. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray for our politicians and those in authority. Give those in government wisdom, humility and courage to serve all people, making our country a better place to live in peace and harmony. We give thanks for all staff working in the NHS for their tireless devotion and dedication in battling with the pandemic. We thank you, Lord, that the progressive vaccination regime is having a positive impact on the virus and we pray that it will continue to be effective. Amen. Amen. We pray for our church and wider community. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together to worship you in freedom and peace. We ask your blessing on the work of this church 
reaching out through various media during lockdown. Holy Spirit, bind us to one another in love and trust within the fellowship of the church. Make us faithful witnesses to your goodness, fearless proclaimers of your truth, and humble seekers of your continuing guidance, however we are able in the current situation. We pray that you will lead us back to collective worship when it is safe to do so. Strengthen our faith through prayer, broaden our hope as we encourage each other, and deepen our love as we share the gospel at home and in the wider community. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for strength for ourselves and others. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to bring into our daily lives your care for one another and a genuine interest in everyone we meet. Help us in our calling as men and women to shine as lights in the world, as witnesses for you. Helping us to observe your commandment to love our neighbours as ourselves. The suffering of people we love is harder to bear than our own. Often we can do so little to share their pain and relieve others of their burdens. You sent your son into the world to suffer and die. You know those feelings better than we do. We pray that you will comfort and relieve those in distress and in their time of need, give them patience in their suffering and bring good out of their troubles. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. This morning's reading is taken from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, and beginning to read at the first verse. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at this saving grace, and I'm full of praise once again. The 21st century has been a pretty depressing affair in many ways so far. There was much talk of hope and expectation as we sang Old Lang Syne to see in the new millennium, but that quickly disappeared in September 2001 when the war on terror began. Since then we've had an economic crash and it seems that economic growth and stability is not going to keep increasing forever throughout our world. And despite the early hype, uh, the world is not becoming a nicer, more peaceful and harmonious place where we can uh, sit around and drink Coca-Cola together because we're all on the Internet. No, once we went online, the world seems only to become a more polarised place, full of fear and extremism full of trolls and Twitter wars. Environmental concerns about uh, global warming, the ozone layer, climate change, give us all pause for thought, but there was still some hope. Until a global pandemic, death and social distancing, lockdowns and more economic devastation. And, you know, <laughs> we're only two decades in to the new century. What more is there still to come? What hope can we have in the 21st century? Is there hope in vaccines, in globalisation, in technological solutions perhaps? Well critics will say that Christianity doesn't really have a solution either. That's all just pie in the sky when you die. The hope of heaven of a better life beyond death for those who believe in Jesus. The promise of a resurrection to new life. Well, even bishops have been known to deny the literal reality of such things. And the world pours scorn on such an idea. 
which really doesn't seem to follow the science as we're meant to. The upshot of all this is that ordinary Christians have been robbed of hope. The hope that they might have had of a resurrection to new life one day. If Jesus didn't really make it beyond death in any real sense, then what hope is there for little old me? So is there any point in believing this stuff anymore? Do we have hope? Is there a better life for us beyond death? Something to look forward to, which will put all this mess into some kind of perspective. Well, the Apostle Paul addresses those very questions in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The answer is Easter. Easter. Paul tells us three things. First, he says, only one gospel is good enough to save us. Then he asserts that life after death is at the heart of that good news. And then finally, he declares that it doesn't matter who tells you about it as long as you believe. So let's look at each of those three points in turn. So the first thing the Apostle Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is that there is only one gospel that is good enough to save us. Now, brothers, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So <clears throat> Paul says at the end of this uh, long letter to the Corinthian church that he wants to remind them of something very important. It's the gospel. The word just means good news, a message from God that we need to hear. Paul preached it to them. They received it. And indeed, they've taken their stand on it, he says. So this is what they believed when they first became Christians. And it's what they're meant to be sticking with as well. Why is it so important to remind them of the gospel? Well, Paul tells us in verse two, it's by believing this gospel that we are saved. Saved. Saved from what? Saved from having to think up something more interesting to do on a Sunday morning? No, I don't think so. Saved from boredom or loneliness or taxes or viruses? Not really. The gospel saves us from God. That's right. The gospel saves us from God, from his righteous anger against our sinful rebellion against him. Because we can't ignore the creator of the universe uh, forever. We can't do that. We can't get away with that. If there is a God who made us and we've neglected to pay any real attention to him, then it's no wonder that he's angry. No wonder he's upset. And if there is this God who is righteous and good, who upholds the moral fabric of the whole universe, then he can't, he can't simply ignore what we do. He can't just wink at our wars and our arguments and smile a friendly little smile while we reject his ways and prefer to live life our own way without him. Thank you very much. He can't sit idly by and watch while we make a mess of ourselves, of our relationships and of his world. So we deserve nothing from God but judgment for the way that we've treated him. But the glory of the Christian faith is that although the bad news is very, very bad indeed, the good news is spectacularly good. God sent his own son, Jesus, to deal with the problem and to save us from the consequences of our sinful thoughts and words and deeds. As verse 3 says, Christ died for our sins. 
not because of his own sins, notice. He was punished by God in our place for our sins. And only that is good enough to save us. Only the gospel of Christ crucified for us is good enough to save us. We can't be saved just by turning over a new leaf and trying to be nice to God and others instead. It never works for very long. We can't be saved by a gospel of good works, a message of God helps those who help themselves and do this, do that, earn your own salvation, earn your way to a new creation, a new place in heaven. What could we ever do to make up for slapping Jesus in the face? No, the only way that we can be saved is through the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Paul says that if we believe this good news, that's what God requires. It will have an impact on our life, of course, when we realise that we're saved entirely by God's mercy. We won't just sit around and do nothing in response to love and kindness like that. But all we need to do, says Paul, to know that we are saved is to hold firmly to this gospel message. Otherwise, it's all in vain. If you just water down the message, then it won't be good enough, like a diluted, faulty vaccine. If we take out the bits about judgment and hell, uh, sexual morality, perhaps, let's change or take those bits out. Well, some people might listen a bit more to our message, I suppose, but the news that they will hear will not do them any good. We need to get the diagnosis right or the prescription will be useless. So we need to keep hold of the gospel as the Bible itself presents it to us or it will do us no good in the long run. So that's the first thing that Paul says to the Corinthians. Only one gospel is good enough to save us. The second thing that he says here is that life after death is at the heart of the gospel. Life after death is at the heart of the good news that we have to proclaim. Paul is writing to the Christians in Corinth who face the same kinds of struggles that we do. There are some people in Corinth who are saying that Biblical Christianity is just a load of rubbish. It's completely outdated and rubbish. Jesus didn't really rise from the dead or anything supernatural like that. And what Paul says to that is that such people are not preaching authentic good news. He reminds them, therefore, of the good news as he himself had received it. He says, verse three, what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And this is the gospel, the gospel that he had preached to them. It's also, he says, the gospel that they had received and believed. This is the gospel, he says, in which you should stand firm because, verse 2, by this gospel, not a watered down version of it, you are saved. Salvation is achieved on the cross, as Paul stressed earlier in this letter. But here he puts more emphasis on the resurrection in verses four to eight. It's important to be clear on this. The resurrection of Jesus and the idea of life after death is absolutely fundamental to the Christian message. Now, these verses here don't prove that the resurrection happened, of course. We can't just quote 1 Corinthians 15 and expect everybody to be instantly convinced that it's all true. But there is some compelling evidence here. For a start, Paul says, if we read the Old Testament rightly, we'll expect the Messiah, to be raised from the dead. See, in verses three and four, he says that Christ died 
and was raised again according to the scriptures. He doesn't mean as it says so in the Bible. It's not according to the scriptures. That's what happened. What he's saying is that the resurrection was in accordance with the scriptures. It is consistent with what we were told would happen in the Old Testament. And not only that, but he says that plenty of people saw Jesus risen from the dead. He appeared, said Paul in verse five, to Peter and then to the twelve, the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. And then we're told in verse six that Jesus appeared to over 500 people at the same time. Now, that couldn't have been a hallucination. That several people would have had the same hallucination is medically impossible let alone 500. Paul even says to the Corinthians that most of these eyewitnesses are still alive at the time of writing. They can be questioned. They can be cross-examined, if you like. It really did happen, he says. Check it out if you want to. Jesus is alive again. Jesus is alive again. He wants was dead but now he has been given new life and there's some excellent indirect evidence for the historical reliability of that claim but these verses are not trying to prove it to us what paul is trying to make abundantly clear is that life after death is at the heart of the good news and it all hinges on jesus's resurrection from the dead. That was no conjuring trick. He really did appear bodily to many witnesses, including weak little old Paul himself. So this is the authentic gospel, the gospel of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. So we can't, we can't simply do away with resurrection and life after death and still call ourselves Christians. That just isn't an option. Easter, the resurrection, is at the heart of Christianity. It isn't about some moral code. It isn't about being nice people living in a caring, loving community or about religious rituals or trying to improve society. That's not it at all. Those may all be very good things. But Christianity is fundamentally about life after death and how, despite the fact that we don't deserve it, Jesus died to make that possible for us. This is the gospel that saves us, says Paul. But if we change the gospel, if we change the message and make it into something else, then what will be the result? Well, according to this, we will not be saved. Without the resurrection, we've believed in vain, says verse 2. Or as he puts it later in this chapter, in verse 19, if Christianity is only about this life, then we are more to be pitied than anybody. Because 99.999% of the blessings of being a Christian are not in this life at all but in the next. If you think that sounds pessimistic, then see if, you, see if you still feel the same in a thousand years time or 10,000 years time. So Easter is absolutely fundamental to everything that we believe. In many ways, it's more important than Christmas. Yet Jesus taking flesh and being born on that first Christmas day was a necessary first step. But we're not saved by his incarnation alone, his birth. We are saved by his death and his resurrection. Easter is more important than Christmas because Easter is about life after death. But more than that, Easter is too important to just be something that we remember one day a year. Indeed, if we only remember what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross and then rose again once a year, 
if we only call that to mind annually, then our Christian lives will be completely impoverished. Because these are central, key, crucial, foundational facts of our faith. We can't just keep that for special days. The death and resurrection of Jesus are so important, we should call them to mind every single day of our lives with immense gratitude to God for them. So since the resurrection is at the heart of the authentic Christian message, let's remember and give thanks for the resurrection each and every day, every single week of the year. So Paul's telling us uh, first that there's only one gospel that is good enough to save us. And secondly, that life after death is at the heart of that authentic gospel. And then finally, he declares in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that it doesn't matter who tells you about this as long as you believe. Look again at verses 8 to 11. Paul says, Last of all, Jesus, risen from the dead, appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. So Paul says, you know, he doesn't actually deserve to be an apostle, a specially appointed messenger of Christ. He persecuted the church. He killed Christians for his living. So he certainly didn't earn this special title of apostle. He acknowledges straight away that it's all been by God's grace, his completely undeserved kindness towards a terrible sinner like Paul. And that grace was not without effect. God saved him from judgment and even made him an apostle, despite the fact that he deserved nothing. But an eternity in hell, God graciously saved him for an eternity in paradise. And that's what the gospel is all about. And because of God's grace, those Corinthians heard the good news through Paul. They could have heard it through others, though. It didn't really matter in the end, says Paul. Verse 11, whether it was I or they, this is what we preach. This good news about life after death, this is what you believed. It doesn't matter who we hear it from. It could be from Paul. It could be as we simply read the Bible for ourselves. It could be through other people as they tell us the good news about what to believe. It could be through a Zoom conversation or a YouTube video or from somebody far, far away. What matters is not who tells you the good news. What matters is that they tell you the real good news. The only gospel that works. The only one that can really give us hope. The gospel is about Jesus dying on a cross to take the punishment for our sins and rising again to new life after death, the first of many to enter that new world. It matters that we get that gospel right. And what matters finally is that when you hear it, you believe it and firmly hold on to it. Otherwise, there's really no point. There's really no point to all this if that's not true. Because, you know, this is not just about religious entertainment. It's not just an ancient history lecture. How we respond to this matters. It matters to you and me today. It matters more than anything else in the whole universe. So how are you going to respond to this? Do you have any other kind of hope that is as solid as this? Let's pray. 
let's just take a moment of quiet to reflect on our own response to this passage of scripture. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good news that Jesus came to bring us life after death. Thank you that you offer us such new life despite our rebellion against you, the way we turn our backs on you in the way that we live. Help us not just to believe this, but to hold firmly to it, to trust in what you have revealed to us here and live our whole lives in the light of what it says. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks very much for joining us this morning and uh, trust that you'll have found this morning encouraging and helpful, that it would help you uh, to grow in your faith and in your love for the Lord Jesus. 
I want to finish where we started this morning with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So let's pray the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I no longer fear the grave. Christ has come, took the sting of death away. Oh